Welcome everybody to what I think is going to be one of the most topical and important discussions taking place here at the Davos World Economic Forum, the post-multicultural era. We increasingly hear that multiculturalism and assimilation policies have failed and that kind of begs the question, where do we go from here, especially at a time of increasing tension and also rapidly changing demographics? Minorities are facing increasing hostility on many fronts, not least among some sectors of kind of like the populist groups around the world. But there's also heightened tension due to concerns over the refugee crisis and also fear over terrorism. So these are all issues we're going to broach. But what we'd like to do is look at what a new social contract would look like, um, a social contract which would establish trust, but also social cohesion. And um, I hope we're going to try within the realms of possible to leave political correctness aside and really look at some of the practicalities linked to this issue. I'm going to introduce you to our panelists. We've got fantastic panelists with us. Um, I'm going to begin with Alexander de Croo, who is the Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium. And uh, Alexander de Croo uh, advocates the use of migrant data to better understand migrant flows and therefore help in the process of integration. So I think that's going to be a very interesting aspect uh, in this discussion. Welcome, Alexander. Thank you. We also have Lonnie Bunch. Now, Lonnie Bunch is the director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian. So as such, just brings an enormous wealth of knowledge about the African American experience passed right up to the present day. Brendan Cox. Brendan Cox is an international activist and campaigner. He co-founded the Migration and Refugee Hub to help better understand the causes of hate crime and how to combat those. Uh, a little word you may all be aware that Brendan Cox's wife was murdered some months ago in an appalling act of hate by an extremist as she was campaigning um, in the Brexit campaigning up, uh, up ahead of the referendum. So we're really delighted to have Brendan with us to share his thoughts. So as I was saying, we want this to be a forward-thinking discussion. I'm good. We have Elif Shafak with us, who is going to be absolutely fantastic. Elif Shafak is an award-winning novelist. Throughout her works, there's this uh, question of integration, but also identity, and how our identities are formed and how they're manipulated. Also, Elif is an active campaigner for minority and women's rights. So we've got an absolutely fantastic panel. So we're going to begin now by looking at the question of multiculturalism today. And I'd like each of you with your own experiences, tell us a little, little bit about how you see that. Um, Alexander de Croo, how do you see multiculturalism in Belgium today? Well, I think by definition, Belgium is, um, is a very multicultural uh, country because we, we always would say it's, it's, it's Europe and small. Uh, different languages, uh, complex political uh, system and, uh, and so on. And obviously a, a significant migration, uh, migration in the past and, and, and still today. And if you look at it candidly, um, I do not think that, that migration was really, uh, was really the problem. Uh, the problem has been uh, integration, mm -hmm. and, and we haven't been very successful on, on, on integration. And, and looking back, you could even wonder if it was really a policy that has been, uh, has been used. Yes, there is integration courses, and there is a, some kind of small exam mm -hmm. you have to do, but that's not how people integrate. It's not because you know the language or the basics of the language that then after that integration will just happen. Integration works in a different way. It, this is about having a job and being part of a community and, and having some common values of the community where you, uh, where you end up. And then you will learn the language and then all the other things will, uh, will come. And um, that I think in, in, in Europe today is the main discussion is what are our values? You would say Europe is a, is, is a liberal society, mm -hmm. liberal way of, uh, way of life based on, on the, um, the values of, of enlightenment. Um, how much are you willing to put that 
on a discussion table some of those uh, of those values and how do you actually make integration work how do you make social cohesion uh, work and that's i think in the current debate about how to deal with migration flows and so on i don't see that debate that debate about integration and social cohesion i haven't seen it and that i think is the key one Elif Shafak, if we're going to build upon what Alexander de Cruz has said, if that debate hasn't happened, and if we're also going to be talking about the post-multicultural era, are we talking about building upon something that's already been created? Or when you look at multiculturalism now, are you saying we have to think afresh? Do we need to rethink this idea right from scratch? I think what worries me is um, <clears throat> how flimsy our memories tend to be, the mm -hmm. collective memory. We have discarded the concept of multiculturalism very easily, very quickly, without paying attention to the fact that it took decades to get there and many, many people had to struggle to achieve mm -hmm. that kind of diversity. Um, I come from a country that has lost its cosmopolitan heritage. I come from Turkey, mm -hmm. a country that has almost never appreciated its diversity. And I think by losing that cosmopolitan heritage, we have lost a lot. And I'm worried that now in Europe we see similar patterns repeating itself. Today what we are witnessing is not only questioning diversity or cosmopolitanism or people like me who, are, who see themselves as world citizens, global souls, but also I think we are question, questioning the very concept of democracy. Uh, and this is something we need to highlight because democracy is far more fragile mm -hmm. than we think it is. And we need to work on it. It's not something we can take for granted. We tend to believe that history always moves forward, but mm -hmm. not necessarily. Sometimes it goes backwards. Sometimes it drills circles, zigzags, pendulums, and we might make the mistakes that our ancestors, grandparents have made. So we can't take things for granted. And I am particularly concerned for Europe. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen it recently. There was a Pew research conducted across 10 different European countries. And the findings were quite interesting. Um, in five countries, uh, especially Netherlands, Italy, mm -hmm. <coughs> Poland, Hungary, um, and France as well, the attitude towards diversity, when people were asked, do you think diversity made your country a worse place? Uh, a significant number of people said, yes, diversity harmed my country. And a third of Europeans have a negative attitude towards the concept of diversity. So we have to take this very seriously in this continent, in this old continent. The history of populism, nationalism, mm -hmm. xenophobia, unfortunately goes back in history. And we need to work hard to make sure the same mistakes are not repeated again. Well, Brendan, then I'm going to come to you because you're very active in Europe as well. Is this something you're seeing too? And, and how do you see the European situation at the moment when it comes to multiculturalism? Does it reflect what Elif is uh, commenting on? I think it's important to, to, to think about what we mean when we talk about multiculturalism mm. because I'm not sure there are any countries, any societies that aren't multicultural, uh, both now but also if you look back at history. If I look back at the UK, uh, you know, not just in terms of uh, the recent inflows of migration you've had, you've always had very different cultures living in the same country. You had the Catholic uh, culture and the Protestant culture. You had the Welsh, the Scottish, the Northern Irish, the English cultures. You had the Yorkshire cultures. You had the Cornish cultures. You've had the different class cultures. So I, I think it's very hard to posit or to think of an idea which is really monocultural. Uh, I'm not sure that those states exist, and I'm not sure if they did, people would want to live in them. I worked a, a, a lot um, uh, in the past on the former Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. and in the 90s there, there was an attempt to create a, a monocultural uh, society but, uh, led by extremists in Bosnia, carving up that country into what they thought were more sort of culturally pure blocks. I'm not sure anybody wants to go, uh, wants to go there. The, the question, I, I think, is more about... Um, if, if multiculturalism uh, has some spectrum to it, where at one end it means multiculturalism but separation, where mm -hmm. the cultures exist in the same, uh, in the same state yep. but don't coexist. Um, and at the other end is a much more sort of um, uh, aggressive assimilationist policy that mm -hmm. you might have in France, for yep. example. I think the, the, the interesting thing is w what are the sort of successful examples of where you've managed to have uh, confident yeah. multiculturalism but also a strong uniting culture that draws those people together. And I think one of the problems 
uh, one of the problems that uh, liberals have uh, have walked into in the past has been talking about difference, mm -hmm. talking and talking and celebrating difference, but not also celebrating what binds us together, what we have in common. And I think it's about how we do both of those things at the same time, which is the challenge. That is a brilliant introduction to my next question for Lonnie Bunch, because as director of the museum, you have an enormous responsibility in that respect to display and show the African-American story, but not to the exclusion of others. Uh, how do you do that and, and how do you see the multicultural story today in the States? Because it's very un unusual because I was thinking what Alif said, you know, history goes in zigzags, but can also really surprise us because under President Barack Obama, according to some polls, race relations got worse. And now we wonder what the situation is going to be un like under Donald Trump. Well, I think the, the challenge for us in the United States is to realize that race and ethnicity has always shaped our national identity. We just mm -hmm. don't admit that. Um, and so part of the goal of any museum, especially the museum I've built, mm -hmm. is to take the African-American experience and use it as a lens to what it means to better understand what it means to be an American. So in a way, the challenge is to say that it is not the need to simply integrate. It's a need to understand that race has shaped who we are as Americans and will always shape it. And I guess the challenge is to figure out what does that mean going forward? What does it mean that in many ways the African-American experience, the ethnic experience in America has really allowed the American dream to be made real in some mm -hmm. ways, that the notions of freedom and liberty as defined by the founding fathers really were made manifest in, in the best ways they can by the minority communities. So the challenge now is to say, in this new world, in this world of Trump, what does race mean? And how do we basically build on the gains that we've taken and not just open the door that allows people to hate again? Um, and to share their concerns about race in negative ways. Because some people ask whether this fear of the other is human nature. And we've asked our social media audience to send in questions for this uh, panel debate. And uh, I'd like to bring in one voice, and this is Andrew Potts, who asks, is multiculturalism just a nice idea, but an idea that can't survive human nature? And I don't know if any one of you guys would like to answer that. Uh, I think it, it all depends on identity politics mm -hmm. because we grow up and, and, and we're being told that we have to reduce ourselves to one single identity. Mm -hmm. And there have been many people throughout history that resisted this. Like in America, for instance, Audre Lorde in 1970s, 60s, African-American women's movement. It was amazing. They would say, yes, I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm a lesbian, I'm a poet, I'm this, that, and many things that you might not see when you look at me. Mm -hmm. I'm all of these things. James Baldwin, he, he did that. These people were always emphasizing multiplicity, plurality. And I think one thing that populisms have in common is that they don't like plurality. They don't like complexity. They want to reduce us to a single tribe. And this is what we are seeing, the, re the, the revival of tribalism. Why not? Why can't we have multiple belongings? Why can't I be Istanbulite and the Londoner at the same time? I have elements from me, from the Middle East, in me from the Middle East, but from the Mediterranean, from the Balkans. I'm a European by choice, the mm -hmm. values that I share, and the global souls, concentric circles. I don't have to be reduced to one single identity. I think this is the main thing that we need to resist. If I can have multiple belongings, if someone else can have multiple belongings, there's a bigger chance that they can overlap and, what, and we can talk about a common ground. But if everything is defined on mutually exclusive mm -hmm. identities, there has, there will be hostility and clash. It's inevitable. I, I, totally, I totally agree with that. I think that um, our, it's too easy to reduce our identity to what we look like, mm -hmm. uh, the color of skin we have, the name we have. I mean, my identity might be defined by a number of things. Maybe it's the football club that I like. Maybe it's the place where I grew up. Maybe it's the music I like. I mean, the definition of identity is much more complex than the way it's being used politically up to now. And, and what you see today, it is... It's politics of identity. And using, using identity and politics combined with fear 
is actually a very toxic combination. Mm. And it's a combination that always leads to labeling people. You look like this, so you are. And this identity means that you are that. And obviously that politics is always about we are good and the other ones are bad. That combination of identity politics and fear is a very dangerous combination. And you see and it being used all the time. It's, yeah. an easy, it's a very easy way of gaining public traction, but with no, never a positive outcome. Yeah. Isn't, Learning, yes. isn't the challenge in some ways to help the public embrace ambiguity? Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, what we've really done is we've reduced things down to this simple answer. You're either this or mm -hmm. you're that. And I would argue that the challenge in the states for the 21st century is really to help people recognize that there aren't simple answers to complex questions, that this ambiguity, these shades of gray, are crucial to our understanding of who we are going forward. Brendan, though, how do you bring that out into the public domain? Because I know that as director of More in Common, you want to make people aware of the, the, the things we do have in common, as Elif was saying. So but how, how do you communicate that? Because you're also facing a hostile press much of the time, mm. well, in some sectors, in Great Britain at least. Mm. I mean, I think to come back to the, the root of that question as mm. well about, uh, about human nature. Mm. So it is definitely true that there is a human instinct um, to be wary of difference. It's mm. how we judged each other if you, you know, look, uh, look back to the sort of state of nature. But there is also, in the human condition, the ability to empathize with others. Mm -hmm. So these different bits of human nature are always in play. And I think what's happened in the last period is that people's feelings of insecurity, whether that's physical insecurity because of perceptions of Islamist terrorism, whether it's economic insecurity following the financial crash, whether it's cultural insecurity uh, with migration, mm. that has activated a, 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 that, um, the concern and the fear of difference. And what we need to spend more time doing is uh, is getting into stories of individuals. That's how people empathise. And again, I think the problem and and the mistake that we too often make is we we react to people's fears and concerns with facts. And what we need to do is we need to connect with people emotionally with their feelings. It's that what, which which I think will change people's minds and engage people around this. Yeah. It's, it's something that I fully, fully agree. In general, I believe liberals, progressives, Democrats, you know, whatever you, you call it, it's a very mixed uh, group of people. But we haven't done a very good job in terms of connecting with, uh, with emotions. And I think we need to talk about emotions more, anger, anxiety, particularly anxiety. It is very understandable to have anxieties about the future of our children, whether they will find the same job opportunities. It is also understandable to have anxieties about refugees, immigrants, mm -hmm. you know, that so much is happening. It's a liquid world. What is not okay is to be guided by fear. So I fully agree. We need to bring more emotional intelligence into the table. And if I may add, I think we need to talk about culture as well. So often we focus on economy and the facts, but what about perceptions? In a country like Poland, they don't have a big issue with diversity, for instance. Mm -hmm. it's an, over 90% yeah. of Poland is white Catholic. But immigration was their number one issue in their national elections. Why is that? You know, so perceptions, emotions, feelings, these are things that political theory underestimates, but we should definitely focus on them. And what about as an author? Do you, do you feel a responsibility as an author to communicate that through mm -hmm. your novels? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. From, I mean, the art of storytelling very much revolves around empathy. It's just the ability to be someone else, even if for a few hours, mm -hmm. for a few days while you're reading a book, thinking, rethinking the same story. Sometimes this could be a historical period from the eyes of another individual. That's why you can bring the voices of minorities, mm -hmm. sexual minorities, cultural minorities, to the center. Those who have been marginalized, you can bring them to the center in a work of fiction. I I really think this is um, there, there are lots of depressing factors coming from Turkey. I've witnessed these things, mm -hmm. but it is an amazing time for culture, people in the world of culture, and I do believe that we need to speak up louder. Um, we we need that empathy that art very much depends on. Well, Lonnie, in that case, then what about in terms of a museum? What can a museum do to help 
heal these social fractures? In some ways, I would argue that museums and culture have been undervalued mm -hmm. in terms of helping us to deal with the political challenges and the economic challenges. Museums are considered one of the few places where different kinds of people have trust mm -hmm. and faith in museums. So I would argue that part of the goal of a place like at the Smithsonian is to recognize that um, often we're talking to people who believe the way we believe. Mm -hmm. But in a museum, we can bring together people of different points of view, help them wrestle with these questions, whether it's through the exhibitions, through the programs, through the education, through the online work, and that ultimately I would argue that museums play a role in providing a glue in helping people to come together. And that, in essence, we haven't taken fullest advantage. And I've argued that museums need to recognize that, on the one hand, there are value when they do the traditional things, mm -hmm. collect things, help people remember. But the most important thing is to say, how do museums help people today? How do you give them tools to mm -hmm. understand their lives, to live their lives? And that's why, for me, if museums can help people understand the kind of complexity, nuance, and ambiguity, um, I think that's a major contribution. But then on the practical front, uh, Alexander, you're faced with a particularly complex situation on how to engage with identity politics promulgated by populists. Now, in the past, it was advocated a kind of a, a policy of non-engagement. Would you conclude that hasn't worked, given the current situation? And, and what should politicians do to move on with this issue? I think um, obviously politicians need to listen to the public and need to understand the public. Mm. Um, if people uh, vote based on anxiety, uh, you could think that that's a mistake, but the anxiety is there. So the biggest mistake you could make is to just ignore it or say, no, mm. that anxiety is not legit legitimate. There's no reason for that. No, and that has happened too much throughout Europe over the last, uh, the last decade. So if there is an anxiety, we need to understand it. And you need to give an answer to that, uh, to that anxiety. Uh, very often when, when you have um, racist reactions, mm -hmm. The racist reactions have an underlying element, and the underlying element is a fear, but the fear is not always towards the person to whom it is being projected. The fear might be about the fear of losing a job or the fear of lack of social cohesion in, uh, in, in, in a community. So there's always an underlying thing. Um, I can understand that today part of the public looks at, at progress and says, you know, if this is progress, um, uh, terrorist attacks in Europe, uh, migration flows which are hard to, uh, to manage, mm -hmm. um, higher job insecurity because of technology. I can understand that a part of the public says if this is progress, you can keep your progress. That's not what I want. We need to have, give an answer to, uh, mm -hmm. to that. And the answer is not to say let's stop globalization. I mean, globalization is there. Mm -hmm. It's a fact. So the question is how do you make people stronger in such an environment? I believe that people who are stronger have a more open mind. How do you make people stronger, though? That well, now, um, well, just one element. Uh, we are in this fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. Every industrial revolution has actually created more jobs than it has destroyed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people say, well, this time it's different. I don't believe so. I, I'm not sure it is that different. But every industrial revolution has always had an educational transformation as a, as a side component. The second industrial revolution has pushed everyone into primary schools to be able to have basic skills. Third industrial revolution pushed people into higher education mm -hmm. because that's what we needed. The question is, fourth industrial revolution, what's the education component to that? And I think a big part of that is, is continuous education. Yep. Today, continuous education is something for the elite, something for a very small group. The question is, how do you make this something for everyone? And that, I think, can reduce anxiety and, and probably opens up the discussion to a lot of other topics. I'd like to bring in another question from our social media because I, it will build upon what you're saying. And it will be for Lonnie Bunch because Ralph Sagdis, as we're trying to understand how this process works, um, asks, are there any studies that suggest how long it takes before conflict between a new culture and an existing one will last? 
<laughs> I, I think that the reality is that studies suggest that some of that is tied to how quickly the new culture um, <coughs> survives economically, mm. right? So it's tied to whether new migrants basically feel that they're having a piece of the American dream, mm -hmm. per se. But I think what we've learned in the States is that that tension lasts for generations and that there's not an easy answer to that and that ultimately what we see is that tension is really something we have to wrestle with and see it not as something that's temporary, but as a long part of what is shaping national identity. Is that, do you see the same thing in Europe, Brendan? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think um, to, to your point on the the economic engagement, it's absolutely mm -hmm. key. If you look at uh, if you look at the UK, for example, those communities that have been successfully integrated into the economy have tended to integrate very well into mm -hmm. societies and communities. It's why, for example, London is very diverse, but very successfully mm -hmm. diverse, very high levels of support for diversity. If you go to some of the northern towns, uh, my wife's constituency, for example, um, th that tended to be industries which were clustered around particular industries, mm -hmm. which then uh, declined. Those people were then left outside the economy uh, and they ended up clustering and uh, becoming less integrated as a result of that. So that's absolutely a key part of it. I think to, to the other point is that uh, alongside museums, I, I do think that um, that wider role in thinking about institutions that promote contact between different people. Mm -hmm. Because what all of the data shows is that when you meet somebody uh, and when you have a human interaction with somebody, uh, over time, that changes your perception of the group. And the problem that we have is that the, where, the, where the, uh, the anger and frustration and intolerance is greatest is in those areas where you have the lowest number of migrants, mm. the lowest levels of di diversity. So we need to think about institutions, we need to think about media, we need to think about cultural How ways. How do you engage media? How are you going to engage media into this uh, in a very positive way? And so that we don't create these ecosystems that we've been talking about where your own views are reflected. Yeah, well, I think it's I think it's partly about us getting much better at telling stories. I think mm. we do have, as I was saying, I think we have a tendency to to meet people's feelings with facts. The the thing that brought this home for me was my wife would often wake up uh, in the morning and say that she hadn't slept all night because mm. the kids had been up, and I'd respond very helpfully, "No, you, you did sleep. I saw you were, you were asleep at, at four a.m." And she'd be very annoyed because I was responding to a very emotional sense of frustration mm. and uh, being annoyed that she hadn't had much sleep with a factual response. <laughs> and I think we on uh, on 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 this side need to get much better at telling the stories. So rather than talking about uh, the percentage of GDP that migrants contribute, to talk about the refugees in uh, Manchester from Syria who rebuilt the flood defences because they felt such thanks and such um, uh, 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 such responsibility into mm. the community that they've been integrated in. And I think until we get better at telling those stories, I think the, the media response will be much more muted. But the other side of the coin, and uh, uh, well, I don't know who would like to talk about this, is, is the question of freedom of speech. How far can you go in what you say? Because you say, yes, some, Alexander de Cruz said some, you know, parts of the population feels they've been shut out. How far can you go in what you say uh, and expressing people's fears and concerns? Concerns. Elif Shafak. I think we, we definitely need to defend freedom of speech, but at the same time be careful about hate speech. Mm. And these are very different things. In a, in a mature democracy, you defend, um, you protect the individual against the excessive power of the state. In countries like Turkey, wobbly democracies or illiberal democracies, it is the other way around. Mm. It's a topsy-turvy world. You, you protect the state from the individual. You protect the state from the words of the minority. So it's always the state that has priority. The way I see it, the state can be criticized full freedom of speech. But if we're talking about a minority mm -hmm. that is already disempowered, an individual, hate speech, particularly the kind of hate speech that incites violence, we have to be careful about. So we can have a more nuanced debate. I am very critical of uh, this attempt to create safe zones in universities you know, blocking mm -hmm. speakers. Uh, I, I don't like that at all. We, we need to hear different, different voices. What makes a democracy work is precisely that multiplicity of voices. 
every nation state has its own official history, uh, official way of looking, meta-narrative. But what makes the distinction between a democracy and non-democracy democracy is that in the former you have multiplicity of interpretations that are not censored, suppressed. So coming from a country like Turkey, where I see more than 140 journalists being jailed, Turkey now became uh, the world's number one jailer for journalists. Uh, it's, it's difficult for intellectuals, writers, words are heavy. We know the power of words. So I'm, I'm <coughs> completely uh, pro freedom of speech, but uh, I also think we need to pay more attention to hate speech and its implications. If I may add just one mm -hmm. thing about uh, immigrants, immigrant populations, it's very interesting to look at Turkish immigrants in Germany, in the UK, in the Netherlands, because they're so completely different. Mm -hmm. And one reason why they're different, of course, is because they come from different, both class backgrounds, but also some come from villages, some come from the cities. Certainly that's a factor, but the way the host country, the new country, receives the immigrants also makes a big difference. It's a, it's a two-way road. Yeah? The way I see it, unless women are integrated, mm -hmm. unless women, girls, are educated and are allowed to go outside those closed communities, the same communities will be more nationalistic, more religious, more enclosed. Gender is a very important factor there that might not be visible at the first glance. But so, yeah. In, yeah, in practical terms then, in Belgium, will you have to protect these women in society? Is that something that you have to set out in very concrete terms, or is it not necessarily done at state level, but more at community level? OK, I'll, I'll come to that. Maybe just okay. to, to, to <laughs> add on what was being said. Look, if, if we say um, people who come to a certain community, mm. you have to respect our norms and values. Mm. You have to somehow integrate in our way of life. I think you can only ask that. From another side, we are extremely harsh on discrimination. I mean, it's impossible to say you have to be one of us, mm -hmm. but if you're looking for a job, well, then you're not mm -hmm. one of us. I mean, this has been happening too much, and I'm not saying that it's everyone, but it happens. And there, I think, Western communities and governments, I think, need to be much, much more punchy on that. Discrimination is something which is unacceptable, and discrimination in the job market, in uh, getting a house, and, and so on, I think we should be much more stricter on that. It's impossible to say, you have to be one of us, and then tolerate the discrimination that is still there. What do you uh, do in situations there. when you've got countries, as Elif mentioned, like Poland and Hungary, where this has really taken grip hmm. of society? I think this is a domain where the European Union is, 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 is not strong enough. Mm. I mean, the European Union is about the economy and it's about security. But from my point of view, it's also about values. Mm. Um, and, and I think we should have more a debate on that and, and, and engage more mm. with, uh, with, with, uh, with member states on that, on that topic. I think on the national level, um, <laughs> I have no problem to intervene. And I would actually have no problem when you see that this is something that is frequent to use methods like mystery shopping and so on. Like what? Like mystery sh shopping, like for, for uh, someone sending for a job application and just recording if discrimination is taking place yeah. and pointing it out. And I wasn't in favor of that five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but if I see sometimes what is happening, I think this is really a crucial, really a crucial element. I mean, how can you, I think most people who migrate actually want to be part of society. Mm -hmm. But if you get a slap in the face all the time, then I would understand a certain, uh, certain reaction to that rejection. But isn't it also crucial in places to actually force the state to deal with these issues. Because in the United States, you know, the notion is that somehow, you know, these rights have been protected, but they were only protected because people lost their lives, because people demanded change, because basically in the United States, the African American community, the minority community said that we expect you to live up to your stated ideals. And we will protest, we will resist, we will push and force. And so for me, I think you can't understand and expect nations to change without getting people coming together and putting political force against them. Brendan Cox, do you find in Great Britain now that the general mood 
is open to this type of discourse, that you can change things. We are a turning point in Great Britain, given obviously the decision to leave the European Union and why that came about, which was largely, in some respects, an anti-immigrant feeling. Mm. I, I think that in, in most European countries, uh, le less so Eastern Europe, but in most Western European countries, you have about uh, a quarter of the population mm. who are very relaxed and very supportive of diversity mm. and multiculturalism. You have about a quarter of the population who are very hostile to it, and then you have about 50% of people who are in the middle. Mm. And depending on the framing, will be either more supportive or more, more, more negative. I think there's two problems that we have. The first is that that 25% who are uh, liberal and progressive mm. have been much more poorly organised and much less vocal than the, than the other extreme. And so the populist right have dominated the mm. space and they've also been much better at connecting emotionally with that 50%. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, those two challenges. One is to activate the, those existing liberal groups, those people with those liberal attitudes. But secondly, to do that in a way that connects with the 50%. Because at the moment, nobody is speaking to those people other than the far right. And if that continues, their space in society will grow and the liberal space will continue to shrink. But that's kind of your role, isn't it, to try and speak to that 50%. Is the 50% receptive? I, I don't just see it as my role at all. I, I think we, we, we all have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, in, in the work that we've done, there is a huge receptivity to a framing around rights and responsibilities, mm -hmm. around uh, the, the, this sort of duality that we've been talking about. So people accept difference mm -hmm. if there is also a sense of sameness. So we have to be talking much more about what binds us together, mm -hmm. what makes us British, what makes us French, what makes us German. And part of that, um, goes back to the founding of those countries and in almost all of those countries there is a sense about difference, about diversity, about engagement, whether it's in the US and it's a nation of immigrants mm -hmm. right from the beginning, whether it's France and the ideas of the revolution, whether it's in the UK and its history of being outward looking. So there's those national founding ideals that we can tap back into. And I think we also need to get much better at talking about and owning patriotism. I think we've uh, we felt uncomfortable about it. What that's meant is that we've left that to the extreme, to the far right, to dominate. Mm -hmm. And they define patriotism in an exclusive way. But it's very easy and very powerful to define patriotism in a much more inclusive way. That's an extremely good point, yeah. Um, I, I want to change tack slightly, and I want to bring Elif in here on the question of refugees. Now, Turkey is an extremely diverse society, it's what you were talking about, but it's also had to come to terms with the massive arrival of lots of a large refugee population. Um, how does a country adapt to such an enormous arrival of people? It's like 2.5 million people, if, if I'm correct. Uh, how does a society adapt, and how, at political level, can a government help that society adapt to this arrival of people who are often traumatized and who may not be necessarily staying for very long. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, the refugee crisis obviously is so, so important. We had the financial crisis mm -hmm. and, then, and then the refugee crisis that it affected so much all across Europe with all the knock-on effects. But what's happening, uh, and it has been going on for so many years, is the worst humanitarian crisis we have seen ever mm -hmm. since the Second World War. Uh, it's a massive, on a massive scale. And because it's an international problem, it can only be solved internationally if there's a cooperation, collaboration uh, among different nations, and if we can act all of us together as world citizens. But this is not what's happening. We have, on the one hand, the very rich Gulf states that are acting as if they have nothing to do with this. And on the other hand, Europe's approach towards the refugee crisis. Unfortunately, when I say Europe, of course, I don't want to generalize, but mostly the, the bureaucracy in Brussels I don't think they saw it early enough and they 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 developed a good strategy. I never understood why they haven't um, supported more sexual minorities coming from the Middle East, women coming from the Middle East, because of the journeys that many immigrants had to take. Those of the, I'm, I'm talking about those who were able to reach the European shores. Mm -hmm. Because they were so dangerous, most of the immigrants that could make those journeys were young men 
between a certain age bracket. Mm -hmm. So when you look at countries like Sweden, it affects the gender ratio. It has its own implications. The whole thing became a big mess, which of course worked directly into the hands of populists and nationalists and, and, and racists. What worries me is overall, the approach has been to outsource the problem, mm -hmm. particularly to three countries, Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. In Turkey, we have around 3 million refugees, and they're not only in uh, refugee camps, actually the overwhelming majority of them are scattered all over the country. And of course, there are cultural clashes, there are economic problems. Uh, life is very difficult. One thing we don't talk about is child brides. The number of child mm -hmm. brides increased in a very dramatic way. There are men marrying Syrian women as their second wives, third wives, even though polygamy is illegal. And these are things that never make the headlines when we read the newspapers. Well, Alexander, I think we're looking at these kind of rapidly changing situations. Now, you advocate, and, and this will be my last question before we come to audience questions, but you, you advocate the use of data to better understand those migrant flows. So how could you respond using that data to what Alif is saying? Well, I, look, we, we live in, in, in a time with, with an abundance of data. And it's almost, for me, it's one of the biggest contradictions, is that we have an abundance of data, and it seems that in the public debate, facts don't matter at all. And, and this, is, this I find very strange. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to better understand who is coming to a certain country, if you think that social inclusion, social cohesion is important, you need to understand who's coming there. I mean, this is not just a person with a name and a certain skin color. Um, every person is different, has his own background before the catastrophe happened and has had his own uh, journey. If you want to th do things well, you have to have an approach which is tailor-made. And that means that you need to better understand who the person is, yeah. that, is uh, that is coming. And, and in the Syrian case, I mean, Syria is a middle-income country with a good education system, with people who actually have a lot of skills in a variety of, uh, of, uh, of domains. Well, then you cannot, as a country, say, okay, we'll just put all of them in the same refugee camp, and then the next six months we're just going to treat everyone exactly the same, uh, the same way. Second element, for example, is to better understand uh, remittances. Remittances are the uh, financial yeah. flows back to home, uh, to home families. These remittances are very important and are the result of very often a gigantic social pressure that exists. Maybe not so much for the Syrian crisis, but uh, migration out of, of Western Africa, for example. It, it has almost become something that someone in the family has to do. And the whole family is putting money together for that um, one person. What does, yeah, what does that do to that person? Then? Well, that person is under a gigantic pressure, mm -hmm. first of all, to whatever it takes, try to get into Europe mm -hmm. with all the dramatic things that we have seen, and has a gigantic pressure to tell to their home families that everything is great, that they are having a job, that financially things are going well, and, uh, and so on. That puts people very often in a very vulnerable uh, situation, and you have to better understand that situation to be able to give an answer to, uh, to that. Okay, well, we're going to take questions from the audience. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to our Euronews viewers for having joined us on TV. Feel free to switch to online to euronews.com because the discussion will continue there. So thank you very much for having been with us. So. Does anybody here in the audience have any questions for our panelists? And if you do, please could you say who you are, where you're from, and who your question is for, and if possible, keep your question as concise as possible. Ah, oh, fantastic. Hi, good morning. Thank you for your comments, everybody. My name is Denise Bradley Tyson. And uh, my question is for Lonnie, just in terms of the election that we just went through. And you know, with President Obama, we thought that we had, were living in a post-racial, you know, post-feminist society in terms of Hillary Clinton being a candidate for president. And the Trump candidacy having seemed to unleash a whole lot of racism, underlying racism that I think a lot of us didn't even know still existed in the country. What role, given the change that's happening in Washington, 
how do you envision the museum changing or having to adapt to, you know, this whole new group of people who are going to be uh, descending upon uh, the capital, nation's capital soon? One of the great hopes of the Smithsonian is that everybody does come because we can educate people. I mean, I think there is this great opportunity um, as new people come to Washington to both help them understand the myths that they're wrestling with and to help them understand the changes that have occurred in the country. I think that um, I feel that with this election, it's even more important to have national museums wrestle with difficult issues. Um, because in some ways, um, there is a great need to bring people together. And the museums are one of the places that do that. I think the other thing, though, to answer your question is, I think we think about how we are bringing people who don't normally talk to each other together. But we're not really trying to change the museum. We think the notions of the scholarship that undergirds it, the, the issues of national identity that, that museums wrestle with, those are there, um, have served us from a variety of administrations. What we hope is that each new administration comes with a curiosity and that we can, as a cultural institution, help to stimulate that curiosity and point it in interesting and important directions. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, ladies, lady, and then afterwards we'll go to you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Mary Carol Harrison I'm from the United States, and this is primarily for Mr. Cox. I've really ad admired how the Canadians have gone about uh, receiving the refugees, how they have individual families, individual groups sponsor them, which I think would be a beautiful way to create the commonality and celebrate the difference as well. Can you comment on how we can use that example in other places where the, the flow is, I know, much greater? So I'd say two things. I think it works on two levels. So I think one, uh, it actually works in terms of integration terms, and it's often both families but then communities that sponsor the refugees that, that come to Canada. And so there's a ready network um, uh, set up in those countries, in those communities, which enable that integration to, to work much more effectively. And secondly, I think it changes the perception uh, of uh, this from being... Um, how it's often perceived in some countries as refugees, migrants being dumped on communities to actually there being a desire and a demand. So it's really changed perceptions. We uh, recently went to Newfoundland on the east coast of Canada and spoke to a whole series of um, uh, very rural communities who had uh, sponsored refugees. And the interesting thing, and one of the things that I think we should talk about much more, is the impact that that had on the, the, the person that was welcoming them. Um, th this was revelationary for a lot of people in terms of the impact it had on their lives. There were people who uh, felt who hadn't had grandchildren who suddenly felt that they had their own grandchildren. It's people who uh, felt that they had a new part of their family. So I think one of the things that we can get better at is not just talking about the person that is coming, but the person that is doing that, that welcoming. We recently did uh, a piece of work with Airbnb uh, in the US uh, uh, where they uh, went out to their host communities and asked in, in the US around Thanksgiving and asked if they would host a, a new American family for Thanksgiving. And the response was absolutely amazing. It was about uh, um, that frame of uh, Americanism. It was through a national institution of Thanksgiving. It was about you as much as it was about them. And I think there's, there's a real power to that sense of that movement of welcomers, and it's something that we're definitely going to work on a lot more in the, in the future as well. Yeah, I think ordinary people really want to have the tools, actually, to be able to reach out and help, but often feel stumped and, and don't know how to do so. It's something I've seen amongst... Uh, and and there, is, there is a growing movement around this, so there's a whole series of countries, actually, uh, uh, a few months ago, just at the end of last year in Canada, there was a new initiative called the Global Refugee Sponsorship I can't remember what it's called, uh, initiative, um, which is exactly around this. And I think there's about five or six countries who are already doing this. There's a whole series of other countries that are looking at it as well. OK, um, a question from this lady. Maybe if it, the question could be for Elif or Alexandra. It might be our last question. 
Okay, I don't know who can answer my uh, question, but uh, in fact, I just want to put a slightly different dimension. I come from Asia, from mm -hmm. Korea. There are many Asians here. So actually, I was recently in a seminar in uh, uh, Beijing talking about your globalization. There's two clear trends we're talking about. One is uh, now globalization used to be westernization from Asian point of view because it was very West dominated and led. But now, because of geoeconomical and geopolitical, really center shifting to Asia. Therefore, now new trend of globalization is Easternization. It doesn't mean East will dominate, just is balancing it off. Another kind of dimension I want to bring in is also the youth culture. In Asia, all the consumerism really led by not by the established media, but many young young girls and boys only like 19 or 20 years old, they become the key opinion leader group. Each of these bloggers or influencers, they have like a 10 to 30 million followers, not only in Asia, around the world, beyond any racial, you know, cultural ba barriers. So I just want to see who can really answer this. Like this new kind of multiculture, young and old, and also new Easternization trend. Absolutely. Anybody can answer. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 you know, coming from the Turkey, I can so 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 relate to what you said, and I do worry a lot about these gaps. You know, both uh, of course economic gaps, economic inequality, but at the same time cultural gaps. Even the same concepts don't mean the same thing as you move from one country to another, such as globalization. You know, the meanings, the descriptions can change enormously. Um, and, and somehow we are unable to make that jump and understand how the discussion is taking place in other countries. So there are some cognitive gaps that we, we need to bridge as well. Overall, I believe, politics in, a, in the usual classical sense, as in left versus right, mm -hmm. that is gone. Something else has come. And so one major um, duality that we need to pay attention <laughs> is this friction between the countryside and cities. This happened in all major European elections. The cities tend to be more liberal, more cosmopolitan, and the countryside different. Another big distinction, is, of course, is gender, uh, sorry, age uh, between youth and older generation. What can make us a little bit more optimistic is the fact that overall, when you look at the map, young people everywhere tend to be more pro-EU, more pro-globalization. You know, so there is a big difference there in terms of age. But then, of course, comes the east-west divide. And that's something we need to understand and we need to communicate across cultures. What I'm worried about, and I hear this both in Turkey and across the Middle East, especially after the Arab Spring, more and more people are saying, wait a minute, maybe democracy is not suitable for us. Maybe it's a Western concept. It works for them. We need to develop our own model. Look at Singapore. Singapore works so well. What we need is a group of technocrats working with bureaucrats under a strong leader. This is the best model. How do we renew people's faith in democracy is going to be a major challenge for those of us who communicate across cultures. That is, uh, on democracy, that is, yeah. that is true. But if you look at, at recent surveys on this, for example, in Africa, actually the, the um, perspective of democracy is much more positive with African population than with yes. Europe today. Yeah. The African population is really aspiring for democracy and, and really believes in the well doings of democracy. Whereas I think here in Europe and the Western world we're actually doubting on that. So so that aspiration for democracy definitely is still, uh, I mean, still now there. Now there's talk about Shanghai 5, you know, Turkey, we used to want to join the EU, now we want to join Shanghai 5 with Russia, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, you know, China. So complete shift. And I'm worried that the more, it only plays into the hands of isolationists when that communication is broken. They say to the young people, you see, they don't want us, we don't want them anyhow, let's move in the opposite direction. This goes to show kind of the level of complexity of this debate it works at so many different levels uh, we're gonna have to close off now but what I would ask each of you now <laughs> is to give us a closing thought but something concrete and practical that uh, our audience here can go away with when it comes to this discussion I'm gonna have to ask you to make those comments briefly Lonnie Bunch well I think that for me it's a recognition that we have an ability to change by protest, by resistance, by communication. Mm -hmm. So I always believe not to be naive, but to be hopeful. 
and to believe in a positive way that change has happened. I come from a community that didn't have anything to do with framing the ideals of America, and yet that community believed in those ideals and has made those ideals concrete. So for me, it's about demanding a country to live up to its stated ideals, but to also use resistance and protest to help the country get there. Elif Shafak. I think I, I like to follow Gramsci's motto. He used to talk about the pessimism of the intellect mm -hmm. and the optimism of the will. And we have reason to be very pessimistic. We need to take populist demagogues very seriously. It was a mistake not to take them seriously earlier on. Um, and and we, have, we don't have the luxury of being apolitical anymore. You know? And this also applies to artists. So that pessimism should, should be there. We should be concerned. But at the same time, there should be optimism of the will and, and the desire to go beyond our echo chambers, connect mm -hmm. with people, communicate, understand their emotions. We need to bring emotional intelligence into, into the picture. And just remember that in life we always learn from people who are different from us. You know, sameness does not bring safety. Mm -hmm. um, and someone who thinks and lives exactly like me yeah, has, it's just an echo of my voice. So diversity is precious and I think it's time to, um, to defend it. Absolutely. Alexander de Croo. I, uh, I think you need uh, people who really bring out a message, which is sometimes not an easy message to, to stand for in the, in, in the public debate. And, and if you just look at Angela Merkel <coughs> six years ago, she said, multiculti is gescheitert. She said, the multicultural uh, society, it didn't work. Yeah. And then six years later, she says, wir schaffen das. So um, minds can shift, yeah. and that's a good thing. And I think um, in these kind of debates, sometimes you have to just stand for what you really, uh, what you really believe in, despite the fact that maybe on the short term is not always the, the most popular message. Brendan Cox. Uh, th three things. Firstly, uh, let's um, uh, communicate with people uh, emotionally, not just factually. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, let's find opportunities uh, to come together with other groups and, and to celebrate what holds us in common. And thirdly, let's talk much more about similarities and not just differences. Well, thank you all. I'd like you all to join me in thanking our panellists, Lonnie Bunch, Elif Shafak, Alexander Cruz and Brendan Cox.